Today we finish our unit on rape and sexual assault by looking at a specific category of sexual abuse, which is sometimes called statutory rape, uh, but what really just means one element of the crime, or at least one element, is uh, strict liability. Um, so this is an area where no mens rea needs to be shown for a specific element. And the primary instance of this, and the one that most people mean when they use the phrase statutory rape, is uh, the uh, sexual abuse of a minor um, below a certain age cutoff. Uh, and so we're going to look at a couple cases in that area, but overall this law isn't too complex or difficult, uh, but it does have some quirks and oddities that are uh, worth exploring, and it gives us one last chance to look at strict liability, uh, since we really just used public welfare offenses as our primary means of analyzing it in the past. Uh, so uh, a statutory rape law as opposed to a typical rape statute I should point out, as we've seen, some jurisdictions meld them together like Kansas. Uh, but the idea of the, the statutory rape law is instead of a non-consent element or a force element, both of those are taken out, they're replaced with either one or two elements. So the first element that would replace the non-consent and force requirement uh, is an age of consent, right? An age of consent will be a magic birthday number uh, under which a person is thought not to be able to consent and past which uh, they are able to. Uh, and so that's what this slide of, of in Katie Holmes and Katie Holmes age is supposed to represent that there is an inherent fiction in this idea that there is a magic moment where somebody becomes mature enough to consent. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of reasons to doubt that to be true. There's uh, developmental psychology literature showing that people mature at different rates, that people are um, you know, not meet, reaching sexual maturity at the same times. Uh, this can be split on genders. Uh, boys and girls sometimes have different developmental um, paths, uh, according to research, because of different hormones and other factors. Um, and also, we know that states are all over the map here. Um, you know, when the country was founded, there was an extreme outlier, even by those standards, that Delaware had an age of consent of only eight. Um, since then, uh, uh, ages of consent have slowly moved up, where they can be as high as 18, uh, and as low as, I believe, 14 now. Uh, 13 was still true in a couple jurisdictions, but I don't know of any uh, that currently maintain 13. But even that range is enormous. If you've known 14 and 18-year-olds in your life, uh, there is a lot of change that occurs in that window of time. Uh, so how do we justify what is inherently a, a legal uh, fiction, convenience uh, used to um, support prosecutions in this area? Well, you know, I think the best justification is uh, simple necessity, that there has to be a line uh, because having it be too fact specific and being based on different developmental paths First of all, you're unlikely to get any agreement in many of these cases where somebody is on, on a quantitative level of their sexual maturity. Uh, but also, um, there's an inherent lag time, which is the time the crime occurred to the time of trial, the person's still maturing and still changing. And so, you know, this is not a, you know, perfect solution to the problem, but it's thought to be the most efficient and pragmatic one. And that's sort of the modern justification for it. I'll talk about one of the historical justifications when we get to it in a case that I, you know, every now and then you still see cited, but I think is, is, not what should be our uh, modern focus here in terms of justifying or explaining our laws. Now, um, most jurisdictions, the, the large majority, have a um, difference in age requirement, meaning that we look at the age of the defendant and the age of the victim and subtract the two, and that difference has to have exceeded whatever the statutory um, difference in age requirement. And here we can see differences as low as one or as high as four. Um, and so in these cases, the notion is that there's some sort of embedded differential that's captured by age so that if uh, two 14-year-olds have a relationship that's sexual in nature in a jurisdiction with an age of consent of 15, that doesn't seem as problematic as, say, a 14-year-old with a 50-year-old. Um, but of course, we know that relationships, as one illustrated here in this uh, uh, slide, although one that itself was problematic and maybe should give us greater pause here, um, is that this difference in age is then comes acceptable the moment the uh, uh, younger person reaches the age of maturity defined in the age of consent. Um, so these two requirements together provide sort of the, the majority rule, but there are some jurisdictions that don't have a difference in age requirement, 
What is the effect of that? Well, it means that in that scenario I just gave you with two 14-year-olds uh, having relations in a jurisdiction with a 15-year-old age of consent, they're both guilty of statutorily raping each other because neither one can consent, and yet they, because they're 14, they can be culpable, at least as an adult in some cases, or uh, through the juvenile justice system. Uh, this is particularly problematic in, say, a jurisdiction with an age of consent of 18, and you have two 17-year-olds having relations, which is very common. Um, those uh, instances of statutory rape, if there's no difference in age requirement, would mean that they'd almost surely be tried as adults. But as I said, this is a minority rule, and most jurisdictions keep the difference in age, even though it's hard to, again, explain why. This is sort of a, a pragmatic justification. But remember when we, in our main section, especially when we talked about Kansas v. Brooks, the law shows an indifference to power imbalances in this area. So if your boss threatens to fire you, bankrupt you, leave you out in the street with, with your kids and no money, and that is has not thought to have been a, a viable theory of uh, force or fear under uh, rape statutes, although Kansas may now be different. Uh, but um, here it, it is put into the law, right? This difference is thought to be significant. And I think, you know, intuitively we all appreciate that and feel it's true, but I just want to highlight the difference there, that in this case we do seem to care about these age proxies for power or maturity or coercion imbalances. But in our general rape and sexual assault cases, power differentials don't factor at all uh, in our majority rules. And maybe even in Kansas, it's still unclear about the effects of Kansas v. Brooks. Okay, so those are our two uh, core requirements. Uh, let's look at our two cases here, uh, Garnett v. State being the first. And this one is you know, pretty much in every criminal law book because it, it really highlights uh, the problem of, of our modern statutory rape approach and the fact that if you're going to support the approach that most jurisdictions have followed, uh, then these are the types of outcomes that come with it. So what is this approach I'm referring to? Well, it's not just that we have those two elements, it's that the majority approach is their strict liability, meaning that for uh, the age requirement, um, I mean the age of consent, uh, it's strict liability. It doesn't matter if the defendant was honestly or reasonably mistaken or doesn't have purpose or knowledge as to uh, the age of the victim. It's just whatever, in fact, the age of the victim was. Uh, the MPC itself um, even included a slightly different way of, of dealing with this problem, but they did have strict liability, at least for people below 10. Then from 10 to 16, it was a burden-shifted um, uh, uh, type analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in class, just because the MPC's idea was interesting, but not necessarily that influential or helpful. Um, but uh, overall, our majority rule is strict liability. And But there is some modern trend against it, as the, one of the dissents notes in the Garnett case, and even the majority acknowledges that some jurisdictions, either via their legislatures or courts, have decided not to treat Mistakes of age, so it's a mistake of fact specific to the age of consent, uh, mistakes of age as um, strict liability and do allow uh, some avenue for defendants to argue. Okay, uh, difference in age is similarly strict liability, but there really are no case law examples. I'll give you one example in class, but it's not worth uh, spending time in the lecture here for. Um, and so what happens to a defendant like Garnett? Because Garnett is biologically of age 20 and he has had sex with someone who is age 13. This is, on those those facts alone, he's guilty, right? I mean, there's just nothing else to be said. The age requirement, age of consent requirements met, the difference in age requirements met, there's strict liability, right? He, he committed the sex act, we know because she's she got pregnant and it can be traced back to him. So he, you know, there's no question that he intended and has no mens rea argument on the sex act element, which is still there. Um, but Garnett is not our typical 20 year old, right? His IQ is 52, which is extremely low. Um, this is on the borderline of ever being able to have any independence in life, will likely live their life in a supervised environment. But IQ is, is not a, a fully, um, you know, IQ is often overestimated in its importance in measuring somebody's functional capability. And I, I think it's unfortunate the court really fixates there because once you're at that level, you often see a lot of accompanying um, sort of uh, emotional um, 
cultural interactive sort of pieces that are also uh, lacking. Um, he, you know, this is the age where he can, you know, perform simple assigned tasks and even work and, and have some um, livelihood and, and experience. But on the other hand, he is likely easily manipulated and confused uh, by other people. And the ability to assess somebody's age might not be something he's very good or, or understanding of, particularly because um, of, you know, his, you know, the facts as we know them in this case, right? He was told uh, by Erica and by Erica's friends that, in fact, she was much older. Um, and, you know, his intellectual maturity and emotional maturity might have been less than hers at this point in time. And so he can be exploited in a way. Um, and so, you know, he's told to get a ladder and come and, and have sex with her. And he does. And, you know, this is there, there is a, a tragedy here because we have a teen pregnancy. And, um, you know, it's the you know, we're not dealing with an actual fake ID. This is um, one of George Bush's daughter's fake IDs. You know, it's not like this is somebody getting into a bar too young. Uh, this is, you know, the fact that it, there's certain people who just through their own path in life are not going to be able to differentiate age as well. Right. They will look at a kid an adult and they'll see maybe a difference there but once you get to this sort of teenagers it blurs together and Garnett might be in that circumstance it's it's difficult to tell because I actually think the factual record here is at least the way the high court characterizes is a little underdeveloped in terms of Garnett's functionality but the majority here just says listen it's strict liability so it doesn't matter that Garnett has factors that inhibit the development of certain types of mens rea or um, might make us doubt his mens rea because mens rea is not required. All that's needed for these two elements is the act requirement. And I think that's right in terms of the application of the law, but in terms of the outcome, is this right? Well, that's that's far less clear. And as I said, this is one of the reasons why the MPC drafters wanted to include at least some mistake of age type arguments or lack of mens rea on age, because there are going to be cases like this. And you'll notice there are two different dissents here, um, one of which I think is just inherently flawed, and one of which, you know, is, is saying, hey, it's in our discretion to change the law. Other, other courts have. It's not just up to the legislature. Because if you remember that, you know, strict liability is something that's inferred, the court here discusses Morissette, acknowledging that Morissette leaves out certain categories of strict liability, and statutory rape is thought to be one of those. So they could certainly say this is consistent with due process, but as the dissent notes, it's the second dissent, Judge Bells, it's certainly within their discretion to say, you know, there should be mens rea here. Because, in fact, the court has to do that all the time when the legislature leaves out mens rea words. So I think the, the Bell opinion could have been the majority, right? Maryland could have done what other states here did. But instead, the majority is we'll let the legislature decide. And if they don't signal otherwise, we'll keep doing it this way, even if cases like Garnett seem pretty sympathetic and seem like a poor application of the law. Judge Eldridge dissent, on the other hand, I want to say is nonsense, and maybe that's a little too harsh. But, you know, it sounds nice to say there's two, you know, diametrically opposed views here. Maybe we should find a compromise in the middle, right? There's strict liability or there's a normal mens rea mistake uh, rule to be applied here. But he never really articulates what that is or why or how this would be implemented. Like even when he says he would order a new trial, it's not clear what standard should be applied because once you decide it's strict liability, mens rea is not need to be proven and you can't make exceptions for different emotional um, uh, people, at least not under our current law, right? If you want to try and say that there's a due process issue for people on different developmental paths, that would be one thing. But he just doesn't really, I think he's just saying he doesn't like the outcome of the majority, uh, but he's not willing to do what Judge Bell is and say, um, we need to change the rule here. Um, and so, yeah, as much appeal, it, you know, from a policy perspective, uh, you might think that Judge Eldridge's dissent has, it, it needs a legal hook to hang on, and, and it's not clear to me what it is. Um, so, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I'm a little more critical of that dissent. Uh, but at the end of the day here, um, the, uh, you know, the majority wins out as it has in many states, and so this maintains, the, this is the rule in lots of the country. Um, now, there is one discussion of sort of the historical justification for this, not just the age of consent rule, but also its strict liability. And it's what, what's called the independent moral wrong theory. And this is what I alluded to at the top, talking about age of consent and its justifications. Um, 
The idea here, you know, in the case that's usually cited to support it is this case, Regina versus Prince, an old English case, that wasn't really a statutory rape statute. It was actually a law about um, dating underage girls or courting them. And the, the, um, in those cases, um, a def well, in this case, a defendant had uh, decided to court an underage uh, girl without asking the father's permission first, because that was actually the, the trigger to the law. So it wasn't so much there was a problem uh, of having relations between an older and a much younger person, including someone we would consider below the age of consent. It was that you had to have the father's permission. And the court justified this sort of strict liability uh, rule in that case by calling it an independent moral wrong, which is sometimes not articulated well, but it basically implies that once you're in this world of sex or dating or in relationships, you're already committing some sort of moral wrong. Um, in part because of this era um, of Regina V. Prince, you know, any sex outside of marriage was was illegal. And certainly the courting processes were far more detached and, and people were supposed to be keeping at a distance. And so I don't think this is a good modern justification for a law because we don't consider all things that are sexual or relationship oriented to be dirty or awful or immoral. And so the independent moral wrong theory, although still occasionally cited, really should be discarded. And so instead, we just need to focus on sort of the pragmatic considerations here. Um, and that is the strongest argument also for strict liability here is that there's a worry that defendants will always be able to argue, at least in many of these cases, that they were mistaken as to the age. Um, and that, in fact, uh, especially with the lag time, the victim will now look much older. It'll be hard to recapture how they looked at that particular time and place. And it's an easily exploitable um, men's rate defense. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be there, right? You know, Morissette said, says we should have this presumption, but that is the justification. It's usually an efficiency, pragmatic uh, sort of rationale there. Um, but I want to at least give you both sides of why uh, some people think there should be mistake of age, some shouldn't. So in jurisdictions that don't have strict liability, we see a lot of different approaches, and I would tell you on exam what they are. Sometimes it's specific intent. Sometimes it's general intent. Sometimes it's a burden shifted, and this follows from the MPC's approach and its influence, which means that it becomes an affirmative defense so that the defendant would have to prove by a preponderance of evidence that they were honestly mistaken as to uh, the age. And so there is a, a lot of different approaches within those jurisdictions that do not decide its strict liability. Okay, then I want to talk briefly just about uh, one last case, which is New Hampshire v. Holmes. And the reason I include it here is uh, it, it helps to, you know, sort of tie back to the very beginning of the semester when we looked at Lawrence v. Texas. Now, it should be obvious that it faced Lawrence v. Texas does not protect statutory rape because, as uh, Justice Kennedy said in the majority, it's between consenting adults and a non-commercial private uh, relationship or encounter. And so... Um, that's that argument's not going to fly, although many defendants tried it, saying that their conduct was protected as a form of sexual liberty. But the de defendant here has a slightly better argument or at least more clever argument. And so I at least want to acknowledge it because they're saying, OK, maybe Lawrence v. Texas doesn't protect um, uh, what I did as a defendant. Um, but it might give us an indication that you, a mens rea should apply and it shouldn't be strict liability. Because if there is this sexual liberty interest, you know, maybe it should also tell us that we need to make sure defendants who are think they're exercising their sexual liberty, in other words, they think they're having a relationship with somebody who's an adult, at least above the age of consent uh, for uh, sex, um, you know, if they believe they're in there, that should be protected. So Lawrence v. Texas has implications for mens rea and statutory rape laws. As I said, I think it's a, a clever argument, and it, it's a, a reasonable extension of Lawrence v. Texas. But as we saw in our cases at the beginning of the semester, Lawrence v. Texas has been construed very narrowly. Courts have not wanted to apply it in any circumstance that wasn't strictly dictated by the opinion, even cases that seem to be strictly dictated by the opinion. And so this is consistent with that pattern, meaning that, again, here the court says, yeah, Lawrence v. Texas happened, but it doesn't really change anything. It's going to be up to the legislature to uh, change the law here. And so New Hampshire maintains their strict liability rule. And so that's, you know, just a, a little update sort of on Garnett to see did Lawrence in the intervening time have an effect here? And the answer is basically no. So that's it for uh, statutory rape and our entire chapter here. We're going to go through the hypotheticals in class, uh, but this provides us you know, some insight into this, this strict liability, broadly speaking, and this specific part of rape and sexual assault that operates a bit differently.